pick up the pace just a little bit. <coughs> when I was growing up, they considered this an invitation hymn, but I, I, I like it. So it don't have to be an invitation. Mm -hmm. 566. Translated the Greek and then English, and in Greek it's it's pronounced completely differently. That's where we get the name Jesus from. It's like Aoesis, and I'm probably saying it wrong. But anyhow, 
The point is, there's a picture there. Now, I'll remind you, crossing the Jordan is not a picture of heaven. It's not. It cannot be because once they cross, there's still battles to fight. There's still work to do. Crossing of the Jordan is a picture of salvation. When you get saved, you inherit the promise. And so they cross the river. There's work yet to do. And the same is true with us. I'm assuming and I'm hoping. I should never assume. I can't see your heart. I don't know where you stand with God, but I just think folks that come to church faithfully on Wednesday night probably are saved. And so if you're saved like I'm saved, in a manner of speaking, you're in the promised land. There's work. You know. So with that in mind, we've looked at the uh, conquest of Canaan so far. Um, just real quickly, if you'll remember, and... Uh, any other time that would jump right out of me. Okay. When they crossed the Jordan River, the first thing they did was set up stones in Gilgal. Do you remember this? I told you this story. A lot of people didn't know this, but when they took stones out, they put stones back in. There's a picture there. Those stones are a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection. That's why they did this. They took those 12 stones out, but they made a point for 12 stones back in. Um, they didn't just take them out. They took some out that are clean, that are washed, that came out of the water, and they took them old dirty ones on the bank, and they put them in there. And there's a picture of that, the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus. And most people don't know that's in there. People focus so much on the crossing of the Red Sea, they don't realize this crossing was so much, so much bigger a deal. Because when you cross a river like this one, it's feeding from up north. And to stop a river that's flowing means you got to heap it up. And the Bible says it wasn't a heap. We read that. We studied that. I'm not going to go backwards. But it was, you know, it's, it's, it's not as hard to dam up the southern portion of the river because that's going to dry up on its own. But that northern flow, to stop that the way that the Lord did, that was an enormous miracle. And it stayed that way until everybody's across. And there's a picture there. They, didn't, you know, there's always somebody to back. I've always wondered who these people are because when I drive, I'm just, I'm, it's that NASCAR mentality. i got to be in the front somewhere. I don't like to be the leader, but I want to be in the top ten, okay? I, <laughs> you ever pass somebody and you're on the interstate and you've got somebody clogging up the hammer lane and you're like, look, either pass people or move. Please just get over out of the way. I don't care how fast you go. Just get out of my way. I'm in the hammer lane and I want to pass somebody. Well, you pass and you're, you're kind of in the front and, and you can see. And that's the reason I want to be up there. I want to make sure there's not some big accident ahead or something. I, I want to see ahead. It comes from driving a truck. You can plan ahead if you can see ahead. Well, what always happens, you get up there and for a while you're the leader. And it's not long and then you're behind a bunch of people again. So anyway, I'm, I'm getting off track. But I don't even know how I got on there. <laughs> when the, well, yeah, dude. When, the, when they crossed, those priests stand there in that water. And God holds it while they cross. And it's not until everybody crosses over does He let the water come back. He waits until that last foot crosses over. Now, obviously, we know that um, the half tribe of uh, Manasseh and, and Gad, and, and, and was, there was a two and a half tribes that stayed there. But I mean, the, the fighting men went over. The first thing they did, set up camp at Gilgal, and you'll notice, they always come back to these stones. Throughout the conquest, that's where they go back to camp. Now, I, I just, I, I don't know for sure, but I think it's because that memorial is set up there for Jesus. They always come back to the memorial that God put there for them. And that's why we should always come back to the, to the you know, the, Jeremiah said to remove not the old landmarks. Really? <laughs> Uh, anyhow, so just to kind of hurry up since that's going to act up. First thing's Jericho. Jericho's a picture of the world. You're not supposed to be a friend of the world. The Bible tells us that. Uh, in fact, in 1 John it said, uh, if you love the world, love the Father's not in you. You're not supposed to love this world. It's okay to love the people and, and, and want to see them saved. It's not okay to love this world. So anyway, Jericho's a picture of that. And that's why he told them you couldn't have anything out of it. It's to be utterly destroyed and you can't have any of the spoil. Every other city that God gave them, they were able to have the spoil. Jericho, he told them, don't touch it. You're not supposed to live your life intermingled with the world. So anyway, we talked about that. Jericho is a spiritual picture of the world. We all fought, fight that battle. And then AI, which it's interesting to me that AI literally stands for artificial intelligence. But there's a picture there of fighting against the flesh. And then we talked about Gibeon. 
They made a deal with Gibeon. There's a picture there of the way we let Satan in, and sometimes we make little deals with him. Well, we'll do this, but we really shouldn't. Anyway, we talked about all that. I know I'm going backwards. So they came into the center of the land, and the Lord gave them the southern portion first. They go down and they take possession of the southern part first. It just proves God loves the south more than the north. Anyway, uh, <laughs> there's actually a verse in Scripture that says, uh, God is from Teman, T E M A N, which means south. There's actually a verse that says that. It's out of context, but it does say that. So, um, there is the uh, picture of that. Then they go north. Now, it, what, we're not going to talk about this tonight. I'm just reminding you. Um, don't get me started on Shechem, Mount Ebal, Mount of Cursing, Mount Gerizim. There again, the Mount of Blessing is in the south. You see that? Mount Gerizim is in the south. That's the Mount of Blessing. Six tribes went up there and shouted down blessings. Mount Ebal is to the north. God sent six tribes up the north face to that mountain to shout down the six cursings. Follow me. Here's your blessings. Don't follow me. Here's your cursings. They did that under Moses. Anyhow, so that's where those are. There's a natural amphitheater in between. There's been several places in the scripture where somebody stood on top of Mount Gerizim and hollered down. And I remind you again, the woman at the well was at Sychar, which is right there next to where Shechem is. May even be where Shechem was. <clears throat> but that well, she said, You say Jerusalem's where we should worship. My father's worshiped in this mountain. That's the mountain she was talking about, Mount Gerizim. That was the Mount of Blessing. She believed that's where they ought to worship. And Jesus says, I'll tell you the truth. There will come a time, you won't worship here or there. Those that worship God will worship Him in spirit and in truth. So you remember that in John chapter 4. Anyway, so that's uh, that's where that takes place. Here's what I want to show you. And the reason I brought it up and what we're going to look at tonight. We left off. Now that's not what I want. That's not what I want. I was trying to show you a, a whole picture. And it's not going to let me do it. Oh, it's not. I guess we'll have to do it like that. I want you to see all this land to the east, all this land up here to the north, which is Lebanon, and all the way down here to the Sinai Peninsula, all the way to Egypt. And as you think about that, turn it with me to Joshua chapter 13. Now, does anybody remember where we left off? Y'all can't all sing out at once when you do. I can hear it. It's going to start chapter 12. Right. I'm yeah. glad you're with me. Thank you for paying attention. <laughs> We're actually skipping chapter 12. I know you got to be thinking, really, Chad? You always go backwards. How can you skip a chapter? Well, I'm so <laughs> glad you asked. Because I want to explain it to you. It's not that it's not important. I believe every word of Scripture is important. It has its place, and we can learn something from every word of Scripture. God didn't give us any part of the Bible that's not useful or helpful in some way, form, or fashion. In fact, I've preached on the lineage of Jesus just at the beginning of Matthew, and you can see four Gentile women. Four Gentile women in the lineage of Christ. And so, anyhow, that, that being said, all of those verses are given you for a reason. So, I'm not saying chapter 12 is not important, but here's what you find. We looked at the conquest of the southern part of the country, down here. Then we looked at the conquest of the north part of the country, and we, we, we talked about all these things up until chapter 12. If you were to read chapter 12, it just lists them. It just tells you the name of the kings and the areas of geography. Now, if you're a geography nut... Study it. You'll love it. It's great. It's not a bad study at all. But most of these names I struggle to pronounce and you wouldn't know where they are. So I'm not, I'm not saying it's not important. It is. But it's for an in-depth study, which we're not going to do here. Um, what I'm going to do is jump to chapter 13. We're going to cover a portion of 13 and we may even get to a part of 14 if we move quickly. So that being said, Joshua 13, 1, the Bible says, Now, <clears throat> Joshua was old and stricken in years. And the Lord said to him, Thou art old and stricken in years, and there remaineth yet very much land to be possessed. Now, don't miss that. He's telling them, there is a lot of land left. If you remember at the end of chapter 11, in fact, uh, glance back there real quick. At the end of chapter 11, I thought it was pretty easy to find. There's a verse there at the end of the chapter where he said that they that, that was the, all of the battles. <sighs> oh, I'm looking at the wrong page. Okay. Um, okay, we're the last verse of chapter 11. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord said unto Moses, and Joshua gave it for an inheritance unto Israel according to their divisions by their tribes, and the land rested from war. Now, I explained that last time we met. Y'all remember what I told you about that? There are those who would argue, no, wait a minute, that says the war's over. 
they won, and it should have been done. They should have had all of the land that they were promised. And there are those who think that. I'm trying to keep this from going on. Um, but here's what you have to remember. Just because someone gives you something doesn't mean you take full advantage of it. Can I get a witness? Just because, okay, the armies are not fighting anymore. They're all retreating. The people who are still there, they're at the mercy of, the, of God's people. Okay, they're at the mercy of God's people. They either have to be killed, which is what uh, seven of those Canaanite tribes was ordered that they do. And then the Lord did permit certain tribes outside of those initial seven that could pay tribute to Israel. So they're either going to be judged and killed or run out or put to paying tribute. One of those three things has to happen. But for that to take place, you've got to take possession of it. It's just like salvation. I can give you salvation all day. I'm offered I, I can. Jesus can offer you salvation all day long. People don't take it, reach out and accept it and take it. What good does it do? Jesus died for everybody, and not everybody is willing to accept that, unfortunately. So anyway, I do believe at the end of these battles, all of the land was available. All the people had to do was take their possession, run out the folks, do what God said to do here. And there's actually a picture of the Christian I'm going to show you. And remember, Joshua and Ephesians goes hand in hand together. I would argue that Ephesians is a New Testament um, type. Uh, it's, it, it, it's very, very similar because we talked about spiritual warfare, and there is a battle. I, people don't like to talk about it. There is a battle that must be fought. So anyway, verse sub uh, 2 says, This is the land that yet remaineth, all the borders of the Philistines. Remember, they have not taken possession, and I've already made it smaller, but Philistia is there. I happen to believe that Philistia today is what we call Palestinians. I happen to believe it's the same word. There's some who would argue with me, and that's okay. That can be wrong. It doesn't hurt my feelings if people are wrong. Um, <laughs> but Gaza, Ashkelon, Gath, these areas where they're going to have to battle with these people and battle with these people and battle with these people. Does anybody remember what kind of a person David had to fight against? Philistine. When he was talking about Goliath, Goliath specifically, he was from Gath. So these Philistines are still there because they didn't take possession of the land. It tells you there in verse 2, this is the land that yet remaineth. All the borders of the Philistines and all of Geshuri. Verse 3, from Sahor, which is before Egypt, even unto the borders of Elkron, northward, which is counted to the Canaanite. Five lords of the Philistines, the Gathites, I'm sorry, the Gazaites, and the Ashdodites, the Eshkelonites, the Gittites, the Ekronites, also the Adites. And then from the south, it lists a bunch of these other Canaanites. Um, here's the point. Hold your place real quick. We'll be right back. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to show you This is just for spiritual application. Philippians chapter 3, specifically verse 12 through 14. And I'll give you a minute to find that. Philippians chapter 3. In fact, I like this chapter so much. I may just back up and read some of this. <laughs> well, there in verse 4 it says, uh, I, may also, I may also have confidence in the flesh. If any other man thinketh he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I am more. And he goes to listing, and there's seven things here he lists. The eighth day of the stock of Israel. Uh, he's a, he circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, that was a favorite tribe because of Rachel, because they thought Joseph was dead for a while. A Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law of blameless. So he names off these seven things that make him better than you, and then he says none of it matters. Verse 7 he says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dumb. He goes a little far here and he says I count them as a big pile of dumb in comparison to what I have in Jesus. All of this other don't matter. It doesn't make any difference if you were born in the royal family. If you're Prince Charles himself. All of that's dumb matched up side of what Jesus offers us in himself. But the point I'm making here in verse 9 he says be found to him not having my own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him. I, I want you to 
Pay close attention to verse 10, and that wasn't even in my notes. I just want you to remember that I said it, okay? It is one thing to know he, who Jesus is, and another thing to know Him. The devil knows who Jesus is. The devil does not know Him on an intimate, personal level. I've said this a thousand times. I'll say it a thousand more. But we may know George Strait, but we don't really know George Strait. If you do, you've got a cell phone number. Can I have a cell phone Anybody got a cell phone number? I'd like to have George Strait's cell phone number. <laughs> the point is, when you know somebody on an intimate level, you know them. You know who they are. You have rapport with them. You, it, was, it was funny. Um, when Brother Dennis came in, he recognized Miss Janice. I know her. We went to school together. We, we know each other. That's a little different than just say, yeah, I've heard of her. She lives over here somewhere. You see what I'm saying? He says in verse 10, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now here's where I was going. All that was extra. You don't have to pay me for it. But all that was extra. Verse 12. Not as though I had already attained. I want you to notice what Paul says here. Paul just listed off seven reasons why he's better than you. Seven reasons why he's better than me. You say, where did he do that? I'm not going to read them again, but if you were to read back over verses 4, 5, and 6, you'll count seven things he claimed were great about himself. But then he went on to say, that's all done. It don't matter. So then here he says, not as though I had already attained. Either were already perfect by his own admission, even with all the good things he's done, even with all the missionary trips he made, even with the 14 books of the Bible that he wrote, he's telling you, I'm not there. And you know what I think of? That old song our kids used to sing. He's still working on me to make me what I'll be. Anyway, surely you all know that song. <clears throat> he says, I haven't attained it yet either. And so here's the point, and this is what we're going to see back in Joshua in just a minute. But he says, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. But, and this is a big heavy but, and I want you to get it. I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Turn back to Joshua. Now, you got to be thinking by now, what has any of that got to do with this map? Well, it's already went off, but here's the point I'm trying to make. There is a vast land there that God gave Israel. And they never took full possession of it all. At the height, and I mean the height of the, the United Israel Kingdom, when Solomon was in power, that was as close as they came, and they still didn't take it all. They still didn't get possession of all that God offered. And we are the same way. You ever met a Christian who thinks they've arrived? They think they've gone far enough. Well, I've I've been on mission trips. I've, I've taught Sunday school. I've sang in a choir. I have told people about Jesus. I've seen folks saved. I even baptized somebody once. I mean, somebody might say that and think, I did my time. I did my part. I, I, I'm good. Well, they need to read about Caleb in chapter 14. He's 85 years old. God was still using him. There is no retirement plan in the service of the Lord. That's what's wrong with people today. This secular work. It's okay to retire on your secular job. I've got no problem with that. If they want to pay you to sit at home, more power to them, more power to you. Don't bother me any. But in the service of the Lord, our job never ends. There's always something more we can do to take the possession that God's given us, this, this salvation that we've got, the Holy Spirit that's within us, the abilities that He grows within us, the talents and tools and gifts that we all have, the development of those. There's always something more we can do, always some way we can grow in Christ. All the way until he takes us home. If Paul has the honesty and the humility to say, I haven't arrived yet, who do you think you are if you think you've arrived? There's, and I don't mean that toward any of you. There's people I meet sometimes, I just shake my head up. These Reverend so and so, or Dr. Reverend so, I'm just driving me bananas. I, I, I'll tell you, I get letters in the mail sometimes that says, the, the Reverend, Mrs. Reverend Jasmine on Ginger Long, thank you. Hey, look, there ain't nothing reverend about me. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I'm not a bit better than anybody else. I just have a calling on my life, and I'm trying to apprehend that. Paul said he was trying to apprehend. Moving on. If you were to study further in this, you'll find that uh, they list off all these names. Verse 6 talks about the inhabitants of the hill country, 
Uh, Lebanon's important, and I've already let the map go down, but y'all should know by now, Lebanon's up there in the north, Tyre and Sidon are in that area. Um, talks about dividing it up and giving it to the people. Verse 7 says it this way, Now therefore divide this land for an inheritance unto the nine tribes and the half tribe of Manasseh. Somebody who's, kept, who's paying attention, why did he say nine tribes and the half tribe of Manasseh? Two and, there's two and a half on the other side. I just want to make sure about it. <laughs> so there's two and a half on the other side. Remember, that's another reason they kept that camp at Gilgal. Because not everybody crossed. If you were a woman or a child or an elderly person, you're still sitting on the other side of the Jordan. So if you get too far away from Gilgal, you're leaving the families over there unprotected. Most of the soldiers all crossed over because the, the agreement was you got to fight to help to take possession of this land and then you can have your but there's so much land on the east side of the Jordan God gave them that they didn't... If you look at Israel today, Jordan, Syria, parts of Iraq and Iran belong to Israel. They're supposed to be Israel. That's why those countries hate Israel to this day. And they'll, one of these days, they're going to give that land up whether they know it yet or not. Anyhow, moving on. Verse uh, 8, um, with whom the Reubenites... It's talking about the uh, half-tribe of Manasseh, the Reubenites, and the Gadites have received their inheritance which Moses gave them beyond Jordan eastward, even as Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave them. And then it, it describes it, which I'm, I'm not going to make you read all that. Verse 9 describes from where to where. And I was going to show you on the map, but since it keeps going off, you'll just have to take my word for it, and I'll do better next week. I'll use my laptop, and it won't do that. Anyhow, just believe me, there's a vast, vast area to the east of the Jordan that also goes with it. To the north, to the east, and to the south. The only reason they, and they didn't even get everything to the west of the Mediterranean, because that's where the Philistines were at. So in every direction, they could have improved their station. They could have fulfilled what God promised them. And by the way, before you judge Israel, where are you? Have you gone as far north in your Christian walk as you can go? How about south? How about east? Are there still some Philistines in your life? So some things you're battling against that ain't supposed to be there. If you can't say amen, say oh me. I'm right there with you. I haven't attained it yet either. I'm just pointing it out to you. He goes on to say, and uh, he covers, there's a bunch of this. Verse 11 talks about Gilead, and then 12 talks about the kingdom of Og and Bashan, which most of these, like I said, you're not going to know where these are anyway. Skip on down, if you will. Um, verse 14. Only unto the tribes of Levi he gave none inheritance. The sacrifices of the Lord God of Israel made by fire in their inheritance as he said unto them. Somebody remember why Levi didn't get an inheritance? They're, they're, they're the priestly tribe. They're scattered throughout all the tribes. See, they took the twelve sons of Jacob. They took... Levi and Joseph out, which makes ten, put Joseph's sons back in because they were like adopted sons to Jacob. So Ephraim and Manasseh took their place. So you've got uh, Levi, who's you got Joseph, who isn't mentioned at all, and then you've got Levi, who is mentioned but doesn't get an inheritance of the land. Ephraim and Manasseh got his portion, and part of that may have something to do with some things that took place in Shechem years before. But we're not going to go backwards. Uh, only God really knows. But the point is, they're given the duty and the privilege and the honor of being the priest of the tribe. I, I've, I've often wondered if Levi wasn't the front runner, the one pushing um, his brothers to, uh, to kill the Shechemites in such a, a hateful manner. But anyway, we're not going to get into that. So, all, the rest of this chapter, and we read 14, I'll read 15. And Moses gave unto the tribe of the children of Reuben inheritance according to their families. And again, the rest of this just lists where that's at. doesn't apply too much to what we're talking about. But the point is and has been, as Christians, there's still land to go and take possession of. There's still spiritual areas of our lives we've not taken possession of. There's things I could do better. I've not taken advantage of yet. Verse 22 mentions Balaam briefly. Anybody remember Balaam? He's the guy who had the really interesting donkey. Anybody remember that donkey? I've often said, if God can speak through a donkey, He can speak through anybody. I know that's true because He's using me. If you can use me, the donkey should be no problem at all. Okay? I'm telling you. I know what I was and where I come from. And if God can use me for anything good, 
then uh, he can use you too, and he will, if you'll just pursue that which he's promised you. These promises, uh, and they're found in Ephesians 6, we'll look at them another time. But I want, I want to get to something else. I want to show you something else. So if you would, just bear with me. Um, I just stopped at verse 22 because of Balaam. It's just talking about what took place with Balaam. If you're not familiar with that story, it's in Numbers 21, I think. Uh, I don't remember. I think it's in Numbers 21. It's a pretty interesting story. We'll cover it. Um, we, should have, we should have covered that already. I don't remember if we did or not. Because uh, we started in Genesis. But anyhow... It talks about the border there, and then verse 24 says, Moses gave inheritance unto the tribe of Gad, even unto the children of Gad, according to their families, and then it lists their land. And then when you get down to verse 29, and Moses gave inheritance unto the half-tribe of Manasseh, and this was the possession of the half-tribe of the children of Manasseh, by their families, and it lists those. And then finally, verse 32 says, These are the countries which Moses did distribute, for inheritance in the plains of Moab on the other side of Jordan by Jericho eastward. But unto the tribe of Levi, Moses gave not any inheritance. The Lord God of Israel was their inheritance as he said unto them. By the way, the Lord God is our inheritance as well. So I, I, I rather like that. But I want to, we've got a few minutes left. I want to talk about Caleb for a minute because Caleb is such an interesting guy. When you get to chapter 14, it's going to start listing how the land is divided. Now, let me just go ahead and say this. From here to chapter 21, there's a lot of stuff we're not going to cover. I will I'll hit it and highlight. You know me well enough to know up until now we've gone chapter by chapter, verse by verse. So I don't make a habit of this. But from 13 to 21, it's mostly just the dividing of the land, giving it to these tribes and allowing them to go in and do what they're supposed to do. Now, some of them do better than others. Some of them take possession of the majority of what God gave them. Some of them don't. Judah's one of those that did a little bit better job. Now, I can pick on some things they did. When you get to Judges, you'll see some of the stuff they did. But they did a better job than most of, the, most of Judah's uh, brethren. So when you get down to verse 6 here, I want to show you something. And we're going to close with this. From 6 to the end of this chapter is where, we, where I plan to stop. The Bible says, Then the children of Judah came to Joshua... In Gilgal, remember, they always return back to that camp in Gilgal where those stones are set up that are a picture of... Where are you at? 14.6, uh, 14, I'm sorry. 14.6. Am, am I talking too fast? I have a habit of doing that. I can't be talking. You skipped around so much. <laughs> well, you usually get mad at me for going backwards. I'm trying to go forward faster. We're, we're cycloning through this. My, oh my. I, I, I'm just doing that, Janice, because some of it's not going to make any difference to most of us. I mean, it, it will if you really want to study it, and I, and I recommend that you do read and study this. Um, in fact, if y'all were like uh, my buddy Mark back there, you've already read ahead of me anyway. You know where I'm going. <laughs> but chapter 14, verse 6, The children of Judah came to, to Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said unto him, Thou knowest the thing, that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee in Kadesh Barnea. Does anybody remember what he's talking about? Raise your hand if you have some idea what this is talking about. Who's Caleb? Does anybody know? You don't remember Caleb? Okay, uh, let me refresh your memories. When they got to Kadesh, Kadesh Barnea, there were 12 spies sent into the land. Forty years prior to the conquest of Canaan, there were 12 spies. God sent them to the land, and they went up and down and through it, and they looked at all of the crops. It'd be like somebody sneaking into America over the southern border, and you know that would never happen. But, <laughs> but it'd be like somebody coming over and just wandering through the land and looking at all the wonderful things there are to offer, at all the big stalks of corn that are growing high, and, and all the, you know, the, the beautiful trees and the, the water, the plentiful water we have here. You know, in some countries, they can't get clean water. That's one of the reasons we're going to Roatan this year is because we want to help in that endeavor. But anyway, the 12 spies went from Kadesh Barnea across into the Promised Land and went up and down in it looking at it for, I want to say it was 40 days, if memory serves. They spent 40 days just looking, wondering, checking things out, and they came back. Ten spies said, this ain't no way. It's a beautiful land. It's everything God said it was, but there ain't no way we can take it. There's giants in there. There's the, they make us look like... Uh, uh, the grasshoppers in their side. We're, we're like grasshoppers for them. They're just stomping like a grasshopper. That's what those ten said. 
There were two who said, no, hey, piece of cake. Hey, we got God on our side. They had that same mentality David has later when he charged down the hill. The Bible says he ran down the hill toward Goliath. There's most of us might have gone, but we'd have gone kind of like this. David <laughs> ran down the hill, and that was the attitude Caleb and Joshua had. Hey, we can do it. God's with us. So we know Joshua, and, and the Lord rewarded him. He's now the leader of Israel. But Caleb was his contemporary. They're similar in age. I want to say, uh, actually, um, Caleb's not much younger than Joshua. Joshua is somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 years old here. I don't know exactly because I think he's 110, the Bible says, when he died at the end of this uh, book. So he'd be somewhere near 100 at this point in time. Remember we talked about, I believe it took seven years to, uh, to, to, to have the, the war over in, in Israel. But we're, we're going backwards. But that's what he's talking about there in verse 6. He says, do you remember what the Lord said about me? Because I honored him. And, and he's going to remind you. Look at this, verse 7. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land. And I was brought, and I brought him word again as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the, uh, made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. So here's what Caleb's saying to Joshua. You remember, brother, back 40 years ago, 45 years ago by now, when it was just you and me? They honored God, they believed God, they wanted to do God's will, and we had to endure those 40 years because of the people who didn't believe. Did you remember the promise that was made? Verse 9, And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance, and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. Watch this, verse 10. And now behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said, these forty and five years even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. He's saying, I'm 85 years old. Now watch this. This is so cool. Verse 11. As yet, I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. Y'all follow that? At 85, he's as strong as he was at 40. That's what my Bible said. There's a couple people in this church that I can think of. Gary McMullen's one of them. I have seen Gary McMullen with his long, thin frame pick up things there. No way I would have believed he could pick up. I mean, I just wouldn't have believed it, but I saw it with my own eyes. He is strong. And he's, what is he, 78, maybe? 77? Something like that. How old's your brother? 77. 77? Mm -hmm. Stout. Mike's another one. I don't know how old. Uh, Ray is, but I bet you Ray is stout. He looks like he'd be pretty strong. Can you imagine, though, being as strong in 85 as you were at 40? I can't either. I can't imagine it now. And I'm, I'm 43. I, don't, I, I think I've lost some strength, if we're being honest. But hey, they lived a little better back then. Took better care of this. I'm just starting to realize it. <laughs> <laughs> or accept it, rather. Yeah. But Caleb says, I'm as strong now as I was. And he says, as my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war both to go out and to come. And he says, hey, I still got a whole lot of fighting left in me. Well, the reason I want to close with this, I want you to think about this. It doesn't make any difference how old you are because spiritually you should be as strong as you ever were. In fact, you ought to be stronger. If we're growing in the Lord, one of the reasons I chose the songs we chose, you're nearer my God to thee. Jesus, keep me near the cross. I love those songs that talk about being near to Jesus. One of my favorite people in the whole Bible is Enoch. Because Enoch walked with God. I love the idea of drawing closer to God. And James said, if we would draw nigh to him, he'd draw nigh to us. You realize God wants to be close to you? He's never wanted anything more. That's all he's wanted since Adam and Eve were created. He just wanted this closeness. I honestly believe God looked down on Enoch. And because they had a relationship, I think God said something to the effect, and this isn't in Scripture. It's in the Chad Amplified Version, but it's not in the Bible. <laughs> but I believe God said something to the effect of, I'm tired of this distance between us. Come on. 
I think that's what happened with Enoch. I think that's why the Bible says he was not, for God took him. Uh, the old joke is, and y'all have heard it a hundred times, but the old joke is that God came over and saw Enoch, and they went for a walk, and they, they got out there walking so long and so far, they looked up, and the Lord said, hey, we're closer to my house than yours, just come on with me. But anyhow, that's just the joke. But I think about Caleb, and I think about the strength God gave him toward the end of his life, and I think about the fact that spiritually, there's no reason we can't have that same, uh, that, that same maturity, that same development in our Christian walk. There's no reason why we shouldn't be as strong as we ever were. But it, it kills me. There's, there's people today who, they'll tell me they've been serving God for 30, 40 years, and it seems like they don't have the faith. Uh, I, let me put it this way. When I first got saved, for a while, it felt like every prayer I prayed, God just answered. It felt like I had God's own ear. Because as a baby Christian, the Lord was more attentive to me, like we are children. When children are born, we're so much more attentive to them because they're babies. They have so many needs to be addressed. As they grow and as they gain some strength and some ability, you've got to let them do some things on their own. And you want to continue to grow close to them, but you've got to let them do for themselves. But when you're a baby Christian, it's the same way. It's like God's right there, like just hovering over you. But as you grow spiritually, as you mature, he steps back and lets you develop. And there's supposed to be a point where in that development, you start hovering back toward him. I think this is one of the reasons why God allows us at the end of our parents' lives to take care of them. There's a picture in that. How many times have I told you? I bet so many times you are sick of hearing it. I know my life is. I've told you and told you and told you that God gave us children to show us a picture of himself. Because I know what it is to love them and hug them and squeeze them and want good things for them. I want to knock them through the wall at the same time. I know how it feels. And I think, I get it. I know how you got to feel because you love me and you take care of me and you guide me and you comfort me and you want good things for me, but I just won't listen. I just won't mind. There's times God probably wants to just go knock me through a wall somewhere. But what I don't say all the time, and I should, is there's another picture there at the end of life when you're taking care of your parents, when you're drawing near to them because you've got to. Now, we'll never have to take care of God. Believe me, he's fine. He's not even hurt, okay? He's fine. But there is a picture toward the end of our parents' lives where we draw back toward them that used to draw, that used to hover over us, now we hover over them. How many of you have ever had to take care of somebody older than you? Well, there's a picture in that because we're supposed to mature to the point that we hover back toward God. We nurture that relationship and we want to be closer to Him. We're supposed to be doing that all along. Anyhow, I need to finish this. Um... He says in verse 12, Now therefore give me this mountain whereof the Lord spake in that day. And I was going to show it to you, but it's, it's called the Hebrew and it's on the map there. Um, we're not going to worry with it tonight. But he said, that, uh, Give me this mountain, for thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there and that the cities were great and fenced. If so be the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. Did y'all catch what Caleb just said? Give me the land with the giants in it. I don't want just any old land. Give me the land where the giants are. Because I'm 85 years old. I'm as strong as I ever was. I've got faith in the same God I had at Kadesh Barnea. Give me the giants. How many of you at 85 years old would have said that? <laughs> no, you just said something more like, all right, I, I'm, where's, the, where's the retirement home? Where's the, where's the easy land? Where's the green grass? Where's the, give me the lower level. I don't even want stairs or steps. Where's the place I can roll in and out, right? Isn't that the way we look at things? Caleb didn't say that. He didn't say nothing about a wheelchair ramp. He didn't say nothing about flat ground. He didn't say nothing about easy. He said, I got war left within me. Give me the giants. I can still drive them out. Oh, that Christians, supposed mature Christians, oh, that Christians would approach their Christianity like this. Can you imagine where our country would be today if these Christians that claim to have served the Lord all these years would do those types of things in their Christianity. And I'm talking to me too. Verse 13, And Joshua blessed him and gave unto Caleb the son of Jephunneh, Hebron, for an inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, <clears throat> the Kenizzite unto this day, because he, watch this, because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron before was 
uh, Kurjath Arba, which Arba was a great man among the Anakims, and the land had rest from war. In other words, after he conquered it, he could rename it. And he did, he renamed the Hebrew. Now, there's a picture in that too, and I'm going to close with this. As you serve God, and God blesses you that service, and He grows you in your walk with Him, there are rewards. Now, I don't do it for the rewards, and you don't either. There's some in this life, but this isn't really the ones I'm worried about. I had a, I had a guy come to me, and he was broken hearted. I mean, if we're being honest, he really was sincerely broken hearted. Because he came to me and he said, Chad, I prayed for this lady in my family. He said, and I had a real peace about uh, the prayer that I had. I just felt like God was leading me to believe she was going to be healed. She was going to get better. Everything was going to be okay. He said, the following week she died. And I'm just so mad at God. Why would he give me this peace and then let her die like that? And I, I looked at him as, as patiently as I could. And I said, do you think she's hurting anymore? Do you think she's suffering anymore? Did God not fulfill every promise He made? Is she not with Him in a better place? See, not all healing is for here. Not all blessing is for here. In fact, I would argue most of it's not for here. And let me say this too. Prosperity preachers really make me mad. Here's why. If any of the disciples of Jesus deserve to be blessed, I'm talking about money, houses, riches, blessed, driving a Lexus, having three private planes, or or, or, or rubbing shoulders with Joe Olstein or whatever. If that, if anybody ever deserved it, I would think the twelve or the eleven disciples of Jesus would have deserved that, and the apostle Paul too. But what happened to them? Every one of them was martyred except John. John might as well have been the bowl him in all. So if the prosperity gospel has any merit, why then did those who followed him the closest suffer so? See, what I see is, it's not about this life, it's about that. And you don't take nothing with you except those you tell about Jesus. Y'all know this, I'm preaching to the choir. All I'm asking you to do is, as you study these things, remember there's a spiritual application. We're to grow in what God has for us. He's, he's got these gifts. He's given you and He's given me. You say, well, I can't stand and talk like you do. Or I can't do these things you do. You're not supposed to. You have a gift. God gave every one of you a gift. Use it, grow it, develop it. I'll say this and I'm through. If you had any other gift, the secular gift, say you were just astronomically good at football or baseball, you wouldn't have any qualms about developing that skill to get a multi-million dollar deal with Dallas Cowboys. I mean, you, you would want to hone that gift and, and try to make it profitable. Why should we do any less with the gifts God's given us? Why should we do any less with the spiritual gifts God's offered? We shouldn't. Anybody have anything before we close? Anything to add, ask? Say? i got one little thing that Please. you reminded me. I was reading a post from my cousin in Houston this week, and his mom and dad were very influential in my Christian life. And he went, his mother's had Parkinson's for a long time, and she's, her voice is not strong, but he went in the assisted living or whatever it is where she's living and they were having a meeting somebody had died the night before and he said his mother was the one at the front speaking to everybody and, and I mean she's all hunched over and she's in bad shape but she was telling them how important it was to know Jesus so they could go to heaven <laughs> and she was preaching to them I'm standing here before you the result of somebody doing that for me. Somebody told me about Jesus and I accepted it. How can I do any less? I think about Polycarp who said, 80 and 4 years have I served him. He has never done me wrong. How can I bet? Amen. All right. Anyone else before we pray? <laughs> Brother Dennis, would you mind closing this with a word of prayer? Boy, we, I just thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to be here hear this brother teach and order to meet all of these precious Christians.